this morning. Let's all stand and turn to page 822. 822. Our great Savior, page 822. <laughs> Trust the service will be a blessing to us. Let's ask for the Lord's help today. Our Father, we are uh, grateful to you for the opportunity that we have to gather in your house today. Lord, we pray that your word would do its work in each of our hearts and then, Lord, in each of our lives. May we not only hear the truth, know the truth, but, Lord, may we put uh, feet to the truth. May we put into action in our lives. We pray most of all for anyone that is here today that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would come to faith in Christ today. To each of us who do know you, Lord, we're grateful to be saved. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to grow by your grace today. Lord, we do want to lift up our president to you this morning and ask that you would continue to give him speedy recovery. We're thankful for the progress he's made. We pray for his medical team to give them wisdom. Lord, we continue to ask that you would heal our land of this virus. Lord, we know more importantly, our, our land needs to be healed of unrighteousness and wickedness. Lord, turn our hearts to you. 
we pray you'd, you'd heal us not only physically, but Lord, more importantly, spiritually. So we recognize that begins with each of us individually today. So may we receive your word personally and put it into practice personally. I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Please remain standing if you would. And page 858. Page 858. Redeemed. Page 858. Try it again. All right, here we go on the second verse. celebration and celebrating the Lord's presence with other believers. <coughs> and we got some guests with us today. Good to have you ladies with us. And it took me about three times to get the name Lois, but I got, I got it. <laughs> Lois and Amy, good to have you here this morning. And uh, we'll have our ushers come. We'll honor the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Let's see, Parker the bike rider. Would you would you thank the Lord for your offering? Dear Lord, I thank you we're able to meet today and I pray that you'll bless this offering. Uh, I also want to pray for the president that you'll uh, help him and heal his body. And uh, I pray the rest of this service will be a blessing to everyone and that you'll speak to our hearts and in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in the Bible. Thank you, Sister Marshall. That was a blessing. And as the Holy Spirit so often does, certainly is fitting of the message this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It is good to be back. Good to see so many here. We have the Griggs back in the morning service. They've been taking care of our junior church for several months, and Pastor Brent and Miss Audrey are going to cover it for uh, the next several weeks, and so we'll try to straighten the Griggs out this morning. We have some catching up to do. <laughs> no, not really. But, uh, we're glad to glad to have everyone here today. Good to see the Sutters here as well, and, and uh, trust that uh, we're all doing well, washing our hands and all those good things, and avoiding the, the virus moving forward. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you're able, if you'll stand, I want to pick it up in verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also 
out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened. But by an equality that now, at this time, your abundance may be a supply for their want, that your abundance also may be a su supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing left, nothing over. He that had gathered little had no lack. Father, I pray you'll help us as we look into your word today. Help us to receive it as the eternal truth that it is and to make appropriate application to our hearts, our minds, to our lives, that we put it into practice according to your will. We pray for your presence and power to be realized today. I pray, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross. May you speak through me. Wash me and cleanse me, Father. Fill me with thy spirit, I ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his worthy, worthy sake. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. It's been a couple weeks since we were in our series here through 2 Corinthians, so I want to review a little bit of what we talked about in our first message here in chapter 8. We uh, asked the question, do you give, and then how do you give? We saw our need to be consistently and systematically giving uh, to the work of the Lord. Uh, God has uh, blessed us, and we are privileged to be giving to God uh, through the local New Testament church. We noted that we should not uh, be giving until it hurts, as it has been said. You don't give until it hurts, but we should be giving until there's joy. We need to learn to give where we enjoy giving. And if you don't have that heart, if you don't have that desire, I would challenge you. I'll, I hope to remember to challenge you at the end of the message with this thought. Ask God to give you a heart of generosity. Yeah. You won't regret it. That's right, you will not lack if you have a heart of generosity. Amen. I like what my friend Evangelist Will Rice uh, said years ago. Uh, the giver will always be able to. The giver will always be able to. If you ask God to give you a heart of generosity, you will not regret it. If you give begrudgingly, you're going to regret every time you pry open your pocketbook. As some would say, you know, oh, so-and-so opened their pocketbook and the malls flew out, you know. Uh, <laughs> that should not be true of any believer, of any Christian. Give until there is joy. This morning I want to adjust our focus a little bit here as we look into the next section of uh, this chapter. Really, this will be the, the last message in chapter 8. We'll move on to chapter 9 next week. At least that's what I plan to do. The Lord obviously can change uh, the direction we go I try to be sensitive to his leading. But I want us to think about this. What is it that motivates you to give? What is it that motivates you to give? You know, there are a lot of, of ways that, that people pull at our heartstrings to try to get us to give or contribute to whatever it may be. We're in the, the, the heat of political season. And all of you know, give to my campaign because, you know, if you don't, the sky's going to fall, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, so-and-so's raising more money than I am, and if they... They have more funds than I do, then this bad thing's going to happen. You know, there's, we're being uh, pulled at to, to contribute to campaigns. And I, I think about some of the commercials or we see on television or hear on a radio, perhaps, or so many times. And, and now they're, they're uh, much uh, a big part of our, many of our social media feeds. Uh, think about what motivates us to give. I, I think of the... Uh, Commercials about the you know the shivering uh, puppy in the in the uh, horrible cold weather and you know give to whatever so we can turn the heat on for this dog outside you know whatever the case is and you know give so we can help these these, these poor uh, little puppies and then you think about something that is obviously much more uh, serious and would pull in all of our heartstrings we see a commercial or a video about a with a soldier in it that's missing a limb or his face has been disfigured because of their service for our great country and, and fighting for our freedoms and for uh, liberties of, of not only our nation and defend freedom not only at home but also abroad. You think about uh, trying to help uh, with their families and with their needs. Perhaps it's a, a photo of a poorly clothed 
very thin, sad face of a young child in a far off distant land. These things that cry at our heartstrings, pull at our heartstrings, and give for this cause. Or maybe it's just a well spoken plea for a specific need. I'm thankful to be part of Bethel Baptist Church, and we are a church that desires to meet needs, and we want to be a help and a, and a blessing. And when, when our church is called upon for a specific need, we, we usually step up to be the plate. I'm thankful, grateful for that. But what is it that motivates you to give? What motivates you? <coughs> I'm sure that most of us in the room despise uh, being played or manipulated. All of us have been in one of those situations where, you know, uh, pull out the checkbook and write the big check or, or you're going to look like the scoundrel in the room. And I, that is no way, by the way, I, I, that's no way for an offering to be taken in a, in a local New Testament church. Right. Right. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't say, hey, there's a real need here, friends. We need this. If, if this money doesn't come in, we're not going to be able to do what, what we've obligated ourselves to or there's a specific need. Obviously, we'd want to be aware, aware of those things, but no one likes to be manipulated. And that shouldn't be, shouldn't be what motivates us to give. You know, there are some people that won't give unless they, they see a need. By the way, that's not the reason you should give. Our priv we're privileged to give to the Lord's work, whether we see the need or not. And by the way, there are needs. There are always needs. To clarify, I'm not speaking about giving this morning because there's a specific need here at Bethel. But there are always needs. Amen. There are always needs. I'm preaching about this because it's in our series as we're preaching through 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul here in this section is, is not begging or manipulating. Please understand that. The Apostle Paul here in this section of the Bible, in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit's not begging us or manipulating, he wasn't manipulating the Corinthians to try to get another dime out of them. Paul is teaching, he's encouraging, he's motivating, and the Spirit of God would desire to do the same for you and I today. We see some more truths here today about grace giving, or growing in the grace of giving. Uh, growing in the grace of generosity. Our, our giving as a child of God is an outflow of, of the love of God within us, and I certainly do hope that all of us know the joy of giving and are encouraged, and, and will be encouraged this morning to continue to give a cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. If you've yet to grow into this grace of giving, I want to challenge you to ask the Lord to give you a heart of generosity. Ask the Lord to develop within you a desire, uh, and I mean this, a desire to give. A lot of people give out of duty. That's right. I have. It's my responsibility. I'm a Christian. I need to give. That's duty. Is it bad to give out of duty? Well, no. It's not any worse than you showing up for work tomorrow morning because it's your duty. You may not feel like being at work, but you have a duty to be at work, so you're going to be at work. It's a responsibility we need to fulfill. Some give out of duty. Others give, I'll say it this way, pridefully. I'm going to prove something to you. I can outgive you. Right? What are you trying to prove? Right? Man, oh man, don't fall into that trap. Learn to give joyfully and generously because God has been so good to you. Yeah. And God wants to give through us. And understand, understand that. I hope that you, you understand that, that truth. God gives uh, through us. But let's notice a couple things here. First of all, I want us to see again in verse 9 that the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest grace giver. If we're going to learn about giving the grace of giving, let's look at the example, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the greatest grace giver. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Christ, he became sin for us. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You talk about a grace giver. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest grace giver. He gave. He gave. He gave so you and I could be redeemed, so you and I could be saved. He is the, the perfect substitute for our sin. In John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, And he is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross, laid down his life a sacrifice. He, he bled and died for you. He was innocent, perfectly sinless, died for you and I, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Why did he do this? Well, because we were so deserving of his grace. I mean, you are, aren't you? Weren't you so deserving of God's grace? I mean, if anybody deserves to be saved, wasn't it you? All of us would say, Pastor, you've got that absolutely wrong. I know. I didn't deserve to be saved. You didn't deserve to be saved. Right. We were not deserving of the grace of God one iota. And I don't know how small an iota is, but I hope you understand. It's very small. It's tiny. We're undeserving of His grace. Let me try to drive this point home with this statement. God does not owe you anything. God does not owe me anything. We are undeserving of any good that comes into our life. God does not owe us anything. God does not owe you anything. Most, most people live with the idea that we, we have good things coming to us. We're, we're self-serving. We, we are entitled to good things in this life, and anybody that tries to restrict any of that, we need to vote them out of office or get them out of our way or burn down their town. Amen. I know I'm getting a little close to home here, but we I am leaving somewhere here this morning. Pay attention. God doesn't owe you anything. Amen. We're undeserving of his grace. In fact, the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us. He demonstrated his love toward us. He, he exemplified his love toward us. In Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right, amen. Oh, the grace of God. We're undeserving of any of God's grace. But the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our chief example in giving, the greatest grace giver is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we are called to partake of his grace. We're called to receive his, his offer, the offer of his grace to us. God, God not only went to the cross and died for you, God is desirous that you would receive the gift. God wants you to be saved. Amen. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I've heard people, with, I mean, I've heard all kinds of crazy things in my days. I've heard people that, that thought they were right in their thinking and being frustrated that God would love them. Now, I'm just angry at God. Why? Because he loves me. I'm such a dirty, rotten, uh, scoundrel sinner. It's, it's horrible that God loves me. I don't know why he died for me. God has done so much to redeem your soul. Why would you be angry at God for trying to save your soul? Well, listen, we live in a time people are, people are messed up. Our thinking is sideways, backwards, upside down, whatever term you want to put on it, probably all of the above at the same time. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is the greatest grace giver and it's demonstrated by his sacrificial substitutionary death for you and for me at the cross. Amen. He died for you. He offers us his grace. Have you received the gift of salvation? Are you a partaker of this great grace? If you receive Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest grace giver. I, I want you to, to get this second point. The Christian, the Christian, the believer, the one who has received salvation, the Christian is the recipient of the greatest gift. There is no greater gift that could be offered to any 
individual, man, woman, boy, or girl, than the redemption of their soul. Right. All the wealth in the world, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not, this is not, uh, what's the term, hyperbole, this is not an exaggeration. All the wealth of the world does not compare to the offer of the gift to redeem your soul from hell. Yeah. And I mean all the wealth of the world. All the wealth that is known and all the wealth that is still hidden. Your soul is more valuable than all the wealth of the world. And God offers to you the redemption of your soul. It's the greatest gift that could ever be offered is the redemption of your soul. Why? Because you're unlovely. We're undeserving of God's grace. That's why it's grace. We're undeserving of his grace. It's his unmerited favor. Keep your place here in 2 Corinthians and go over a couple pages, pages to Ephesians chapter 1. I'll remind you of a phrase here in verse 9. That ye through his, that, that ye through his poverty might be rich might be rich. The Christian is the recipient of the greatest gift. When we repent of our sin and receive Christ as our Savior, we receive the gift of redemption, the gift of salvation. Notice with me the gift, uh, or made rich by redemption, verses 7 and 8. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us, in all wisdom and prudence. Redemption, the, the riches of his grace. It's the forgiveness of our a filthy, wicked, horrible sin. We've been redeemed. We've been bought back from the just sentence for our crimes against God. Redemption. That's the great grace of God. Now, you may think yourself a horrible sinner. You may think yourself not much of a sinner or somewhere in between. The fact of the matter is the smallest of our sins require death. Right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word glory, we could also, uh, a synonym for it would be the standard of God. The, uh, all have sinned and come short of the requirements to enter heaven, the standard of heaven, the glory of God. All of us are sinners, whether we think our sin is small or great. We come short of the glory of God. But redemption is offered to us, the, the riches of his grace, the, the, the redemption that is offered to us. And, and Christian brothers and sisters, I hope that you're growing in a greater understanding of all that it is that God has given to us in redemption. We're sinners, deserving of hell. But God in his great grace and, and Christ in his sacrifice for us, his shed blood at Calvary has bought us back from our just penalty, our just reward. In a negative sense, for our sin. God loves us. The Christian's the recipient of the greatest gift. We, we've been made rich by redemption. I want you to think also not only by redemption, but by relationship. Notice from me verses 13 and 14 of Ephesians chapter 1. In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Not only does a Christian receive when they trust Christ as Savior redemption, but we have the privilege and the opportunity of a relationship with God. Amen. The riches of his grace, the blessing and the bounty that is ours to have a relationship with a perfect, holy, righteous God, our creator desires to have fellowship with you and with me. Are you enjoying your relationship with the Lord? The earnest of our, our wealth, it's, it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's the fellowship of God. It's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit within us. We become the dwelling place of God. Our brain cannot comprehend that. 
We, 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 cannot, we, we cannot fathom how God would, would desire to indwell us. We, we cannot. We're, we're sinners. We, we are constantly, what are we constantly doing? If we're, if we're desiring to be right with God, we're constantly keeping short accounts with God and confessing and forsaking and, Lord, help me. Like Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, woe is me. Woe is me. Try as we may, we, we fail. Yet God in his great grace and and it, it, his wealth toward us, his desire for us to have a relationship. I don't want us to miss something here. I want, us to, I want to go back. I want to draw your attention here to something in verse 13, because this is key this morning. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. And I, I hope to drive this home a little, a little more specifically at the end of the message, but I want to make this point here right now. There's a difference between hearing the truth and trusting the truth. There's a difference between knowing the gospel and receiving the gospel. Right. There is a difference. There's a difference between, between understanding what the Bible says and actually believing and applying it to our lives. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Listen, you may know, you may know that Christ is the only way of redemption, and you may know that you are a sinner, but knowing those two facts does not make you a child of God. You must personally, individually, repent of your sin and receive Christ as your personal Savior. Right. Amen. Have you received him? Not only do we see the greatest gift here, we're, we're rich because of the redemption offered to us, the relationship with God offered to us. But I want you to think about one other, one other uh, term here, one other thought, one other blessing and benefit of the riches of God, and that is the reward that is ours of the riches of heaven. Notice from the verses 17 and 18 of Ephesians 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Riches of the glory of his inheritance. What is that? What is it to know these things? The riches of heaven are not measured in dollars and cents. The riches of heaven are not measured in gold and silver and precious stones. But knowing what the, the wealth that is given to us, it's the relationship we have with God and the privilege that is ours to spend eternity with, with him in a place that knows no sin. Yeah. In a place that knows no sickness, a place that knows no sadness, heaven. The, the riches there are true riches. They're not temporary. They're eternal. The Christian is the recipient of the, the greatest gift. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest giver. You want to you be wealthy? Grow in Christ's likeness. You'll enjoy wealth and riches that this world cannot comprehend. But you'll enjoy them. And may I share this with you? You'll be able to enjoy the riches of this world because the riches of this world will not have you. You'll Amen. have them. That's right. Amen. You say, Pastor, there's no difference. Oh, friend, there is a, a vast difference. It is night and day. Riches, riches of this world will consume you. But if you'll fall in love with Christ and you'll grow in Christ's likeness, the wealth of this world will become uh, something you can use. It'll become a tool. And you will no longer be the tool of the wealth. Right. The wealth will be a tool in your hands. Amen. Live your life like Christ would live it. I want you to see thirdly this morning that the grace giver 
exemplifies Christ. See, Christ is the greatest grace giver, and the Christian is the recipient of the greatest gift. But the grace giver, the Christian that is growing in Christ's likeness, exemplifies Christ. Christ, back in our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, notice verse 10. I want us to see this. Christ keeps his word. And herein I give my advice, Paul says, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So what had happened here is that the Corinthian church had made commitments. Yes, we're going to give. We've seen the need. We're going to give to this need. And they made the commitment. They began to make the commitment, but then they stopped about a year ago. And Paul is compelling them. He's encouraging them. Hey, let's, let's keep our word. Let's fulfill what we said we were going to do. In other words, we can say it like this. The Christian, the grace giver, exemplifies Christ. Christ keeps his word. And a good Christian does too. Right. Christ keeps his word and a good Christian does too. Have you ever had someone take advantage of your ethics? Someone set you up and you made a commitment and then later they reveal to you just how big of a commitment you made and you didn't realize the whole truth. Ever had somebody use your ethics against you? Man, it's frustrating, isn't it? Someone kind of sets you up, you know. They ask you a question without giving you all the information and you answer the question and then they tell you the rest of the information. You go, whoa, 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 whoa. And then they pull one of those, well, wait a minute, you're a Christian, aren't you? And we need to be wise about what we, how we make our commitments. We do. We need to be wise. But listen, Christ keeps his word. And a good Christian keeps his word as well. We need to keep our commitments. We need to keep our word. We stand. We are grateful that God is faithful. We stand because God is faithful. We are grateful that God is faithful. God keeps his promises. God keeps his word. His word is eternally true. Amen. God keeps his word. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God keeps his word. You say, preacher, does that apply to me? Absolutely. Whosoever. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. But you know, there are other passages in this book that tell us about the judgment that's going to be had for those who reject Christ. They're just as true as whosoever will may come. <coughs> Hell is just as eternal as heaven. Are you a recipient of the greatest gift? The grace giver, the Christian, exemplifies Christ. Christ gives generously and joyfully, and a good Christian does too. Notice what the Bible says. Skip ahead to chapter 9, notice verse 7. I know we'll probably get there next week, but let me point this out here this morning. I want you to see it. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, shall let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Christ gives generously and joyfully, and Christ desires that we would give generously and joyfully too. Christ doesn't give begrudgingly. Now some of you, some of us might think, you know, when God saved me, he didn't get a very good deal, and he must have thought, well, all right, I did make that commitment. I mean, who sure will? <laughs> Jimmy's asking me to save him, so I, I have to. Listen, God didn't take that attitude with you. And if you're saved, God didn't have that attitude with you. That's right. You may be sitting here this morning and say, Preacher, if God would have that attitude with me. You don't know how bad of a sinner I am. God would never take that attitude with you. That's right. You can come to him in repentance, receive the gift of salvation. God will give to you joyfully and cheerfully redemption. Amen. God desires to save your soul. God desires to give cheerfully and generously. You know, Christianity is good philosophy. Living our lives the way Christ would have us live them is a good way to think. It's good philosophy. It's good reason. You know, biblical principles work for lost people. You aware of that? Right. 
In fact, there, there, there are lost people that have written books that I know of pastors that have used some of these lost people's books for Sunday school curriculum because of the 10 points in there, how to be successful, whatever. Uh, they're Bible principles. Christian philosophy, Christian reason works. The Christian Christianity is good philosophy. But good Christianity is only understood when it is practiced. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. What's that talking about? It's talking about when we, by faith, apply the word of God to our life, our understanding is illuminated. It makes sense to us how that it could be possible that we could enjoy giving away our wealth. How's that possible? It's not understood. Do you, by faith, apply it? Right. We understand the Bible as we apply the Bible to our lives. Bible truths are not just philosophical ideas for us to ponder and weigh against other philosophical ideas. Can I repeat that to make sure you got it? Bible truths are not just philosophical ideas for us to ponder upon and weigh them against other philosophies of this world. That's right. See, that's what our society and that's what the world at large is trying to get us to, to think. Just weigh what the Bible says and then weigh what so-and-so says and weigh what this religion says and just kind of figure out which one you think fits you best and live that way and it'll all be good. A friend, it doesn't work. Amen. Bible Truth is not just some philosophical idea to ponder. They're principles to be lived by. They're principles to obey. Truths to be applied to our lives. Let me try to illustrate this this way. Our American founders, our forefathers, founded our nation with an acknowledgement and an understanding of divine law. That's right. What does that mean? Pastor, do you believe that all of the founders of our nation were Bible believers and understood and were Christians just like you and me? No. But our founders understood there was a God. Our founders understood that we are created. Our founders understood that this book was God's word. Amen. There's, there was a, an underlying principle in, the, in our founding documents. It, it's referenced in the founding documents, an understanding of divine law. What is divine law? It's God's law. It is, therefore, the law of the universe. It's a universal law. It's, it's God's law. It's what God says. Right? It's just as true as the law of gravity. Divine law. It's more true than the law of gravity. Divine law is referenced throughout our founding documents. I preached a message probably 15 years ago now on a, a 4th of July season, uh, the Declaration of Dependence. But Pastor, you got that wrong. No, I don't. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, you will see that the Declaration of Independence was filled with a dependence on God. Amen. Divine law is referenced throughout our founding documents. Divine law is good philosophy. The best years of our nation to date have been realized when our nation generally yielded to Christ and to divine law, to the word of God, an understanding that God's word supersedes the Constitution of the United States. Right. Amen. Amen. I'm not being ugly, but this needs to be said. There's a lot of Christians that need to figure that out. Amen. The Word of God and God are above our nation. Amen. Amen. Good philosophy does not make good people. But good people follow and practice good philosophy. What is good, good philosophy? It's the Word of God and the will of God. And good people are following the word of God and the will of God. See, we've got to move from this philosophical concept and thinking and reasoning and, and settling for that being all that's necessary. No, we've got to apply that good philosophy, that good reason, the word of God to our lives. 
We as believers need to do likewise. We see it in our nation. We see it in our, our government. Just a, the Constitution is the law of the land. I have a friend who said it this way. The Constitution is our king. As Americans, the Constitution of the United States is our king. You recognize the president cannot supersede the Constitution of the United States? Right. Now, I'm about to say something that may be a bit controversial, but you need to hear this. The Supreme Court cannot supersede the Constitution of the United States. Right. 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 Why do I say that might be controversial? Because the majority of our population does not understand that. That's right. The majority of our population has bought into a theory in law, and some of you may be versed in legal terms, it's called a social contract theory. What does that mean? That means whatever the majority of the society wants, that's what will make the laws. Now on the surface, that might sound good. We are a democracy after all, aren't we? Here's the problem. What about when the majority of the society goes against divine law or against the laws of the Constitution? Should the Supreme Court say, well, this is okay, we're in a different place now, let's change our Constitution in order to fit with society? Does that work? We're living with the, we're living with the problem right. of a social contract theory relative to the Constitution of the United States. See, it's not just conservative or liberal. It's obvious where I stand. I'm a conservative. But it's not, it's not, this is not a battle between conservatives and, and liberals. It's a battle about whether the Constitution is the law of our land or not. Whether it's just a good philosophy or whether it is our Constitution. It matters. You say, Pastor, what does all this have to do with what we're talking about this morning? I'm, I'm getting there. Stay with me. All right, let me give you, let me give you an example here. The battle in our judiciary for the last several decades has been between whether we rest or rely on the founding documents as written or whether or not we adjust them to our current day. Let me give you two examples. Two examples. If our founders understood divine law was the supreme law, and they did, and we understand that divine law is the supreme law, the Constitution works, it makes sense, and our society works, it makes sense. That's right. When we throw out divine law, listen, we usher in issues such as abortion. Yes, right. Well, our founders never said that we could not allow abortion in our country, so we need to take a, a poll of the people and decide whether or not we should. No. Divine law supersedes the Constitution. Amen. Preach it. A present issue is these sodomite marriages. Well, our founding fathers never addressed this issue. It wasn't necessary. That's right. Divine law supersedes the Constitution, and they understood, our founders understood, that divine law superseded the Constitution. Those were things that didn't need to be addressed. Friend, they don't need to be stated in the Constitution today. But when we have a judiciary that thinks it can set or rewrite the Constitution, we're in danger. That's right. Why? Because we've moved from these good philosophies to I can pick and choose how I want to apply whatever I want to apply in my life and everything's going to be just fine. And we're living in the chaos in our society because of that kind of reasoning, that kind of thinking. That's right. right now, let me try to bring this back around. I went off on a tangent. Stay with me. We're doing the same things as Christians. Mm -hmm. I know that's what the Bible says, Pastor, but you know, the Bible's kind of outdated. And if... God were alive today. I'm not sure that's the way. Whoa. Whoa. Who are you to rewrite the Bible? Amen. Amen. Who am I to try to tell God that he didn't know what he was doing when he gave us the scriptures? You see, the Christian life, the Christian philosophy is good reasoning. But it won't matter if we're not living it out in our lives. We've got to apply the Word of God to our life. We've got to live the Word of God. Christianity is good philosophy, but it does no good if it's not lived. Grace giving is good philosophy, and it works. It's not crying. Oh, I'm 
dirty, rotten scoundrel sinner you need to get. That's not grace giving. What is grace giving? It's Lord, thank you. I'm so undeserving of your grace. I don't know why you would say that. Lord, it's my privilege to contribute a small portion of what you bless me with each week or month or whenever. To try to demonstrate a little bit of what you've given me because, Lord, I love you. Amen. Christian giving is not manipulative. Are you guys are you following this this morning? I hope you're getting this. This is not a plea to get more out of you. This is going to be mildly dangerous. Mildly dangerous. I know I've got everybody's attention now. I'd rather you learn to give out of love than out of discipline. It'd be better to give out of love than out of discipline. The giving is good. But you need to learn to give out of love for God because of all that he's given to us. That's what Paul's compelling this church here. Look, look at the grace that is abounded to you and to us. See that you grow in this grace also. God isn't trying to get in order to take from you. God is trying to get you so he can give through you and give to you. Amen. Oh, that we get that truth. Listen, what, what, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going too long. I apologize, but I, I want to make sure we understand this. What did God get when he got you? If we're honest and humble, our honest response has to be nothing. It's nothing. That's right. We got nothing. Unworthy I am of the blood of the Lamb. But God loves me. And He gave to me. He's the greatest grace giver. And it's our privilege as His child. Growing in Christ's likeness to demonstrate a little bit of that grace given by giving back. What a privilege. God's not trying to get from me. God has given me everything. Yeah. It's my privilege to give. The gospel is the good news to all who believe. That's the philosophy, if I can put it that way. And to receive. You know, the gospel's bad news to those who hear it. And reject it. That's right. It's good news to those who receive it. Christians, are you philosophical? Or are you practical? Are you satisfied with the knowledge? Or are you desirous to put feet to the truth in your life? May that be our desire. May that be our desire. Not to just live in the philosophy, but to live in the practical. The young man was in love, infatuated with a gal. I mean, she was the apple of his eye. And young love, you know, they write love notes. You're familiar. Some of you probably penned some. And sometimes they really are nonsensical. Well, this young lad was, I mean, he was he, he was in love. I'd climb the highest hill for you, baby. I love you. I'd traverse the widest sea, baby. I love you. I'd cross the driest desert because I love you. P.S. If it's not raining, I'll be over Friday night. <laughs> Let's not live in the philosophy. Let's live in the practice. Father, I pray you'd help us to apply your word to our hearts and lives. Lord, so much of our days are consumed with thinking and philosophy. Lord, we need to be living the Christian life. Thank you for your great grace extended to us at Calvary. Lord, I pray if there are any here today that have never received Christ as their Savior, they'd come and be saved today. To those of us who are your own, Lord, I pray you've compelled us today to take that next step of faith 
grow in love with you and our relationship with thee. Lord, if you would so lead, I pray you would challenge us this morning to ask you to give us a heart or a bigger heart of generosity, exemplifying you, the greatest giver of all. Work in our midst today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. <clears throat>